Hello everyone and welcome back. Now that we know the basics of CUDA programming, let's return to the sample application that we have been using as a running example throughout this course. For all nodes i and j, we want to know what is the cheapest route from i to j that takes at most two hops. We have seen many CPU implementations for this problem, but here is the first baseline implementation, which is a good starting point for developing a simple GPU solution. In this task, we need to calculate n by n results, and computing each result takes n steps. So how do we split this in GPU threads, and how do we organize threads in blocks? Let's now do what is probably the first thing that comes to mind. We just let one thread compute one result. So there will be n by n threads, each doing n units of work. Uh, what about blocks? Well, if one thread computes one result, maybe one block would compute b by b results. If we pick b is 16, then the number of threads is uh, 256 per block, which is a nice round multiple of 32. So we've got n by n threads, organized in blocks of size 256. So, for instance, if n is uh, 1600, we will need to create 100 by 100 blocks, each with 16 by 16 threads. Now, if we do what we already learned, we can create 10,000 blocks with 256 threads each. Then, as we know, blocks will be numbered from 0 to 9,999, and threads within a block will be numbered from 0 to 255. And then, in the kernel, we can check what is our block index and thread index, and then we will know which element i, j of the result matrix we are supposed to compute. It takes maybe a moment to figure out the math, but maybe something like this does the trick. Now, Something like this is very common in many GPU programs. Our input and output are some kind of arrays, and we would somehow like to associate one thread with some coordinate pair. So just to make our life a bit easier, CUDA makes it possible to use two-dimensional and three-dimensional block and thread indexes. Something like this. We can ask CUDA to number our blocks with index pairs, and independently of that, we can also ask CUDA to number our threads within each block with index pairs. So we won't anymore have a thread 123. It will be a thread with coordinates 11,7. And now, once you see the block index and the thread index, it's a bit more straightforward to figure out what would be the corresponding i, j pair that this thread is responsible for computing. So this is what we will use in our sample code today. But I'd really like to emphasize that these two-dimensional indexes are just a convenience feature. If you find it confusing or unhelpful, you can always use just one-dimensional thread and block indexes and interpret them in your code whichever way you like. You won't lose anything if you do that. In normal C++ code, you can use a pair of nested loops, or one loop and then some arithmetic. This is similar. You can use two-dimensional indexes, or one-dimensional index and then some arithmetic. Uh, one final technical detail. In the previous example, our input dimensions were a nice multiple of 16. What if this isn't the case? Well, we will simply round the number of blocks up then there will be some threads that would be responsible for calculating something that goes outside the boundaries. Those threads will simply do nothing. We will just see if i or j are too large, and those threads will just stop immediately. So, now we are ready to implement the kernel. As usual, we start by checking who we are and calculating what to do. And, as we just discussed, We'll just return from the kernel early if there is nothing to do for us. And that's basically it. The rest is just direct copy-paste from our CPU solution, and we are done. Note that here pointers R and D have to point somewhere in the GPU memory. 
so that the kernel can read and write arrays RND. So in the CPU side code, we will need to allocate some GPU memory. Move our input data there and also copy the result back from the GPU memory to the CPU memory. This is what our CPU side code looks like. Again, I've left out all error checking here to keep it short, but let's not forget it in real code. So we allocate some GPU memory for the input data and the result. We copy the input data from the CPU memory, known as host, to the GPU memory, known as device. Then the new thing here is that we use the structure DIM3 to define multidimensional thread and block indexes. We will have n over 16 by n over 16 blocks rounded up, and each block has 16 by 16 threads. We launch the kernel and copy the result back to the CPU memory. And as usual, CUDA memcopy will wait for all threads to finish their work. And then we just release memory and we are done. So let's benchmark. We'll use a bit larger input size this time and for n equals 6300, the baseline CPU solution took roughly 400 seconds, and the fastest parallelized CPU solution took roughly 2 seconds. So where are we now with this GPU solution? It turns out that the running time is around 40 seconds. Somewhat disappointing. We've got three times more processing power than the CPU, and we managed to write something 20 times slower. So what's the main bottleneck here? If you guessed that it might be related to memory reads, you are absolutely right. We have already seen that in CPU code, a huge challenge is getting data fast enough from the CPU memory, so that the CPU would have something useful to do. And this challenge doesn't go away when you switch to GPU programming. As we will discuss later in more detail, the memory system of GPUs is different from what we have in CPUs. And there is often a lot more bandwidth available, but still the same basic principle remains. If you don't pay attention to memory accesses, your performance will suffer. One thing we could do is to try to reduce the number of memory reads, just like on the CPU side. But let's do that a bit later. Let's first try to see if we can make our memory reads cheaper. As we've said already many times, threads in GPUs are not independent. They are organized in warps, and the entire warp runs in a synchronous manner. If one thread is reading memory, the entire warp is reading memory. Different warps of the block aren't necessarily synchronized, but threads of one warp are always. So whenever you do a memory access in your kernel, don't think that this is just one memory read. It is always 32 memory reads. And not all such memory reads are equally expensive. Just like CPU memory, also GPU memory works in cache lines. If threads read all over the place in the GPU memory, then you will need to fetch many cache lines from the memory. There's limited bandwidth, so reading lots of cache lines takes a lot of time. But if the memory reads are better localized, the GPU needs to fetch a smaller number of cache lines to serve the threads. And this is what you want to see. Your entire warp makes memory requests that fall within a small number of cache lines. Or maybe like this. Maybe many threads read the same memory element. Again, it is good as you can serve all requests by reading a small number of cache lines. So to summarize, one memory read in the kernel means 32 memory reads simultaneously. If your threads access a small continuous part of memory, everything will fit in a small number of cache lines and things are good. If you read 32 different locations far from each other, you will likely need to read 32 cache lines, which is bad. So how are we doing from this perspective in our program? First, we need to know which threads form a warp. With one-dimensional indexing, it's simple. The first 32 thread indexes is one warp, etc. 
With two-dimensional indexing, we just need to know that y index is more significant than x index, and then again the first 32 index pairs is one warp, etc. So, for instance, the first warp of the first block will have j equal to 0 or 1, but i will range from 0 to 15. Now, what happens uh, inside the innermost loop? Let's say n is 1000. In the first iteration, k is 0, so here we will read element 1000 times i. And now i ranges from 0 to 15. So we are reading all over the place. Element d0, element d1000, element d2000, etc. This is clearly bad. We read 16 different words far from each other, and we need probably 16 cache lines of data. This isn't as bad as possible. We are not reading 32 different elements, just 16, but still far from ideal. Note that the second memory read is much better. Here j is 0 or 1, so we will just read two memory locations, and they are next to each other. And something similar happens in each iteration. Here k is 1, the first memory read is all over the place. The second memory read is good. And k equals 2, the same story. And it doesn't matter which warp you look at, something similar happens for each warp. So how could we fix this? Let's just do a seemingly small change and exchange the roles of i and j. So instead of calculating element i, j, we calculate element j, i. A seemingly minor change. Why does this matter? Let's see. The first warp, the first iteration. What do we read here? We are just reading two distinct locations. They are far from each other, but still clearly something that fits in two cache lines. Good. But what about the other memory read? Are we now in trouble there as we exchange the roles of i and j? No, we are doing well also here. We read 16 different memory locations, but they are nicely packed next to each other, so a small number of cache lines is enough to cover them. So now both memory reads are good. And something similar happens in each step. k is 1, good memory access pattern. k is 2, good memory access pattern. And you can check that there is nothing special about the first warp. All warps do something equally good. So we would now expect a better performance, at least if memory lookups were the bottleneck. Let's benchmark. Our baseline took 42 seconds. We exchanged the rows of two indexes, and the running time is now only 8 seconds. So memory access pattern really matters. It makes a lot of sense to pay attention to what a warp of threads is doing. The key lesson is this. Even though threads are the only primitive we use in GPUs, we can't program them as if we just had a whole bunch of independent threads. There is structure. Threads are organized in blocks. Blocks consist of warps, and all threads of a warp take steps in a synchronous manner. This matters especially when you reason about memory reads. Now, of course, this is not the best that we can do with GPUs. Having cheaper memory lookups is nice, but having fewer memory lookups is even better. And if we apply the familiar idea of reusing data in registers, we can get really big performance improvements already outperforming our near-optimal CPU solution. Now, what next? So far, we haven't really made any good use of the concept of a block. We, we have just defined blocks of some size, but the block as a whole hasn't done anything useful. All threads of a block have worked independently. Next week, we will learn more about GPU programming, and there we will learn how the threads of a block can work together, coordinate their work, communicate with each other, and use so-called shared memory to store small amounts of block-wide information so that it is quickly available to all threads of the block. And that's all for today. Thanks everyone. Bye now. 
and see you next week.